Please, Stefan. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this, uh, I would say, practical introduction to containment forms. So I do not want to go into all the theoretical details that we have, but I just would like to give you a flavor on uh, what containment form actually is and what one could do with it. And I leave the uh, details for your um, own studying and, of course, questions uh, in the coffee breaks or whatever. So you will see my name written here, but of course uh, containment foam has not been developed by me alone. Um, I have a list of uh, people. We worked together since uh, 2015 primarily on uh, containment foam. PhD students, master students, interns, uh, we had the trainees for software developing. Uh, all of them we came together contributing the one or the other part on, on containment foam. And, this being said, uh, in case you're interested to contribute, of course, uh, you're very welcome just to get in touch and uh, propose the one or the other um, detail. The mics are on, yeah? Okay. I can hardly do anything about it. Okay, I can try to speak louder. Maybe that's it. Um, there were also a number of projects sponsoring the one or the other activity. I don't want to go in, in all these details, but uh, just again to highlight that activities like Encore really help to, um, to drive such a project forward by, let's say, enabling exchange among peers that uh, are in the same situation, um, uh, we develop best practices and so on. And last but not least, also a number of uh, personal uh, collaborations uh, helped us a lot um, to, to drive this thing forward. So if you want to get it, um, there's a very easy way. We put it into a short link, go.fzj.de slash containment form, and be aware these last four um, letters are capital. Um, where you can take this uh, QR code and you will end up in the repository. Um, and it will follow the same way like you are used to from yesterday. You will find the all W make script, you just run it and it will install a containment form as an add-on to your um, open form version. And this time it's not ESI, but the foundation version 9 that we use as a basis. So unfortunately you have to, to install a second one um, first. Okay, so for today, um, for the next, I would say one hour, one hour 15, I would like to give you um, an overview on containment foam um, being an example on how to tailor open foam for a nuclear safety application. So we will discuss a bit on what containment foam actually is, what we develop it for, um, and on this basis we can also then see which kind of functionality open foam gives us, which kind of functionality we need to uh, tailor for our purposes, um, and how actually we did it. So with this, of course, we have to discuss a bit about the background. I assume you're not that much familiar with uh, CV accidents and containment analysis, so I will dive a bit into this. And um, I will also here and there have a quick look um, on uh, the model, the equations, how we put this into the code and how it actually looks like um, from a user's perspective. And finally also I will highlight a bit uh, where the journey uh, with containment form will uh, go to. So be aware, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Uh, within 60 or to 90 minutes, not much is possible, but um, there's much more hidden and uh, of course, this is to be discussed. So the outline will be uh, first a bit a practical um, introduction on the, the background, the applications we aim at, then briefly on the strategy we're following for developing containment form and the particularities. I will briefly touch the theoretical background. I have a lot of slides here, but I don't want to go each of them explain deeply the physics, but I would just tell you that these are special models we have here. Uh, for good reasons and um, how actually we did it. So a kind of example um, on the process. And I will then at the end give you some uh, insights in uh, let's say the framework we build around containment form. So it's not just a code, it's for us it's also a collection of best practices on how to use the code, how to do these developments together um, and how to work with the code on, on practical applications. So we have a, a kind of guided workflow tool that we've developed. We have a solution monitor that helps us to analyze the, the solution on runtime. I, I would like to show this to you before I conclude my talk on uh, our work. Okay, so what's a severe accident? 
what's the target application? Uh, there are many ways to explain it. I, I would like to do it um, by the way of the defense in depth concept, which is probably well familiar to all of you. It's actually um, a concept of staggered barriers that um, should prevent the release of fission products to the environment. These are the fuel matrix, the fuel claddings, the reactor cooling system, and finally the containment. So we have, again, also um, a set of staggered barriers on an organizational and technical level that will prevent that um, those barriers will fail. And um, we've seen these different levels you see here. Um, the first three levels, they are what we call in the design basis, so a lot of engineered safety features that will simply prevent that the accident is um, progressing. And the try to stabilize the plant, while when we are approaching or we are crossing this line, we are going into the level four, uh, it's assumed that the engineered safety features also failed and um, the plant is going into a severe state, meaning that the, the fuel is being damaged. And in this, um, what we will easily see is that the containment becomes the last barrier against the release of fission products, and of course it is of utmost importance to make sure that it will um, stay intact and there is no, no release. So in order to do that, we need to understand all the processes that happened in the containment and that may challenge uh, in its integrity. And one thing that's really um, a big threat to the containment is a combustion event, something like what happened in Fukushima. Here it happened not within the containment, it, it happened in the building around, but at least it drove our attention to uh, that, that kind of risk again. So, you know, whenever there's uh, steam getting in contact with a hot metallic surface, it can corrode this or oxidize this surface and produce a lot of steam, uh, hydrogen, which is uh, released to the containment. And also in the later phase of an accident, when the molten corium is getting in contact with uh, concrete, it will decompose the con concrete and produce a lot of hydrogen, uh, carbon monoxide, which are combustible gases. So if you look at this um, from the perspective of a ternary diagram, so you see here on the lower axis the fuel, uh, on, the left, uh, on the right axis the inert gases, on the left axis the oxidizer, we can characterize a kind of regime where um, the gas mixture itself is flammable and there's even a smaller regime where the gas mixture can undergo a detonation. Um, then we can put our accident uh, sequence in this, uh, this plot. And you see, actually, we will start here somewhere with a, with a dry atmosphere. In the top, we will release a lot of steam. Um, for example, in the loss of coolant, we'll at some point start producing and releasing hydrogen. So we are going a bit more away from the axis, up to a point where the release of steam and the condensation of steam in the containment is balanced. And then the atmosphere is drying out again. And we will run into this uh, potentially flammable regime. This is actually not a big problem as long as the combustion process that is um, resulting or can result is um, a slow process. That means the energy is more or less transferred into heat. But when it accelerates and becomes a fast combustion, we can have a dynamic effects, so shock waves. And uh, at this point, let's say the pressure may be higher than the um, PAICC, the adiabatic isochoric complete combustion pressure that we use to, to design uh, the containment. So these things, they heavily depend on the geometry, on the turbulence of the flow, and of course, uh, need some uh, three-dimensional understanding. There can be other effects like standing flames, which result from, uh, let's say, continuous uh, release. These are local phenomena also, again, benefit from a three-dimensional representation. When we do CFD in such an uh, environment, of course, it's not the standalone tool, so it just embeds into a, a, an analysis chain starting from a very, um, let's say, quick running tools that help us to, to screen out the most penalizing sequences, um, to select those which are, let's say, of high interest for um, our analysis, to prepare source terms uh, that we can use in the um, more detailed codes. <coughs> and then once those, um, those uh, scenarios are found, there will be also, again, a, a, let's say, a set of analyses with increasing detail to, to understand where potential um, risk can be and uh, how safety um, measures, safety systems can be, can be implemented. This step, we can go and run CFD to study the three-dimensional ev evolution of the um, flammable cloud. And of course, we can give this information to um, combustion solvers 
um, which are also, for example, made on the uh, basis of open form. Um, but we can also simply use um, empirical criteria to say uh, acceptable, non-acceptable, and iterate the process of improving the, the safety concept. And finally, also, um, this let's say three-dimensional combustion loads can be given to, to fluid structure interaction for very refined um, assessment. So in this context, CFD is, um, I would say, somewhere in between um, an experiment and a system code analysis. So it will um, not replace the system codes, um, for sure, but it will help us to, to gain more understanding um, for example, when, when we use experiments to validate the system codes. So we can get insights where we don't have measurements, we can help to design experiments, we can help to design the nodalization scheme of, uh, of the system codes. We can help to, um, let's say, um, get the best out of the experiments by doing some preliminary design studies. Um, we can help upscaling experiments. I mean, you know CFD doesn't have any length scales in the equation, so it's easier to scale up than uh, the system codes. And also it can help us to understand 3D effects which are simply uh, ignored in uh, the simple 1D or 2D approximations. The challenge here is, of course, that we have to isolate our problem and get the proper initial and boundary condition, and these, of course, with a much higher level of detail than it would be needed for a system code. Often, what we do here is apply CFD to something that's a bit off standard. So it's not easy to use models that come from, uh, let's say, uh, IC engines or from aerodynamics, um, turbo machinery, and apply them to containment analysis without questioning their validation basis. And also getting a hand on the feedback of the system. So this is for me everything that's coming from the, the containment as its own, from the operators, from uh, the safety systems that are installed. This is something which is typically not a standard piece in a CFD simulation. So I would like to show you a few examples. We did uh, starting with an international standard problem um, that was run in a, I would say, quite application-oriented um, setting. So this is the Battelle model containment a former test facility in, in Frankfurt in Germany, which had a volume of roughly 650 meter cube, and um, it was compartmentalized in a way to mimic uh, the rooms in a, in a German PWR containment. The concrete building, so there were some leakages which were not, um, not really quantified. This was not easy to, to account for in the simulation and, and left some questions, but at the end it, it was a nice setting for us to, to test the model on some realistic um, application and at least with some experimental uh, references. Um, it was a complex transient you see here for uh, roughly a hundred and something thousand seconds and what we did actually was we were just studying uh, a in quick injection of steam and aerosols, hygroscopic aerosol material and then a depletion phase where the system is coming to rest, steam is condensing and the aerosols are settling. And afterwards, there are some other injection phases with different modes, which we, which we did not consider so far. See a CFD typical mesh. So we have some refinements uh, where we assume gradients uh, like the jet flow here or the boundary layers um, close to the walls. And a typical mesh size of roughly two and a half million cells in the fluid, which I would say is um, close to a standard uh, CFD application in this case. OpenFOAM gives us a nice tool to initialize such a case. So you can imagine we did not want to run 17 hours preconditioning of the facility just to come up with a good initial condition for um, doing this work. So there's a tool that, that Carlo already mentioned that we used in the, in the very first um, tutorial, which is called TopoSet. This allows us simply to pick, uh, pick up a set of cells and then do something to the cells. So what we did here, we, we selected all those rooms, the compartments. We, took a representative measurement of temperature, concentration, and so on. And we applied this filter to select all the cells that are either in the volume or, let's say, within a certain thickness around the volume. So we could give an initial field to the structures and the fluid. Then we let this diffuse to get some initialization for the solid structure temperatures. We run a short transient to get an initialization of the three-dimensional flow field. And with this, we could jump directly into the interesting piece of the transient. So this is a way we also um, think of using it um, later within uh, application to containment.
get some initialization from the system side, put it into containment form, and then run a, a certain time frame of the transit. Looking at the experimental data, I would say the results are okay, still improvable, but given the uncertainties we have, I, I was pretty satisfied doing this, so we were able to get a I would say reasonable agreement of um, the temperature field above the injection and below it was a bit difficult. Here we have a lot of stagnating flows and weak flows, so it was giving us a higher um, differences. All in all, I was um, pretty satisfied. Looking at um, the distribution of aerosol material, I would say um, we captured uh, the initial peak during the injection phase, but the depletion rates were somewhat looking different. But um, yeah, this just made uh, based on uh, three samples that we had during that time. So there's a huge uncertainty here, but still I would say the tool was generally um, able of capturing the phenomenology with the one or the other, uh, let's say, overestimated or underestimated tendency. What I would conclude is that this kind of first of its kind application um, of containment foam with a lot of different physics inside um, was really challenging. Um, but it was possible and doable, and overall the results were um, plausible, and we could showcase that running such a transient of 20,000 seconds is absolutely possible within a reasonable time, and reasonable time here would mean 128 cores um, and something like a 20 days runtime um, for these 20,000 seconds. So here we, we achieved something like 400 to 700 seconds per day, depending on the phase. So you can imagine if you have a fast injection, uh, time steps are small, it's rather slow, and in the uh, stagnating phase, you can easily ramp up with the time steps. So um, I would say the method itself, it's application ready, but it's something that's still uh, expensive for long transients, and we, we need to find good approximations for modeling the, the injection even or in particular when they are of a high momentum. We are currently putting this into, um, let's say, full-scale containment analysis within the Amhaiko project, a European project, which aims at analyzing the uh, combustion risk in, um, let's say, the, the Western types of uh, containments in Europe. And um, we want to do this with particular focus on the late phase, so where we have hydrogen and CO. And the idea is here to, again, screen two different scenarios using lamparameter codes, having a fast analysis of them in uh, 3D code Gothic to identify those, um, let's say, compartments and the time sequence which are of high interest, and then go into a detailed assessment with CFD, um, not to compute a combustion process at the end, but to give some idea on how effective different mitigative strategies are and um, also to, to see, uh, let's say, if the instrumentation that the operators have um, will allow them to, um, to really understand the situation in the containment and, and take the right decisions. In a similar fashion, we went together with colleagues from Munich um, to analyze the combustion process. So they develop a, a solver which is called explosion dynamics foam. It's a compressible solver which allows to, to uh, really solve for these um, shock waves. And the, the way, um, the initial step was um, similar to what I presented before, running the system code, mapping the information on a 3D mesh, and then simply igniting it to assess the combustion loads. But here we miss an important factor, and this is the turbulent uh, of the flow um, shortly before the, the combustion. So turbulence leads to a wrinkling of the flame surface, and this will then speed up the reaction rates and uh, lead to acceleration of the flame. So the idea we had here was simply to add another intermediate step after mapping the data running containment foam for a few minutes just to um, develop a certain flow field, develop um, an initial turbulence level to um, then give to the combustion code and assess the we do similar things in the non-nuclear field. So um, this is a technology demonstrator plant that we build in our campus. Um, it's very prototypic in many senses, and of course it combines a lot of hydrogen technologies. And again here it's uh, very important to make sure that uh, no combustible mixtures can occur. So uh, we put this into containment form run different accident scenarios to see uh, how the, um, the mitigation strategies in place, something like active venting, 
um, safety shut, uh, shut off valves and so on, they will um, prevent formation of flammable mixtures. So um, I will not detail this, but at the end, CFD in such an application is uh, really the tool to go since um, this is completely um, new. The future will go a bit more into um, direction of small and modular reactor concepts. Again, more on the focus of light water reactors since this is what we developed most of the models in containment form for and we picked out representative types of those reactors um, which have on the one side a dry containment with a lot of passive safety features like you see here the iris concept. There's a small containment um, which can go up to a higher pressure than a classical one. And actually what happens if there's a, a loss of coolant here is that um, the dry well will be pressurized, the gas, let's say non-condensables plus steam will be purged into this pressure suppression pool. Um, the steam will be condensed, the non-condensables accumulate in this um, gas space here, will be purged partly into the liquid gravity makeup system. And by this, let's say the, the pressure in the dry well will be a function of, uh, let's say, uh, um, in balance with the pressure in these two gas spaces here. So you can imagine you will never be able to predict this if you are not able to predict the pressure in those uh, gas spaces here as well. It becomes a bit more complex in the later phase of this accident when uh, there's a pressure equilibrium in the dry well and these gas spaces and uh, the steam production rate, the decay heat of um, the, the fission products will go down. That means um, we will have a reversal of the flow. So now um, water will be purged over from the pressure suppression pool into the dry well and accumulate here in the cavity. So this will enable some cooling, external cooling of the reactor pressure vessel and um, also lead then to the fact that uh, part of the dry well is filled up with water so um, it will affect the, the free volume that we have. So all in all, this poses quite some challenges on the model. So we have to somewhat consider the system feedback. We have to go probably for a, a more complex way of modeling condensation. And also we have to, to consider um, that uh, there are no non-condensable gases. They are simply perched over into these um, this, um, uh, volumes here. Another concept is um, these uh, submerged containments like we have it for New World or New Scale which um, rely on, in the late phase um, of the accident, on an external cooling of uh, the containment, a removal of the decay heat into um, the surrounding pool as an uh, ultimate heat sink. And here we have a, a natural circulation on the outer side. This is a very tall containment, uh, something like 25 meters tall. Um, at a very high Rayleigh number. And again, this is something which is completely out of the, the validation range of the empirical correlations um, that, we, that we use today. So here CFD can help to, um, to study this, also in link with the processes on the inner side of the containment. It can help to study the effect of, uh, let's say, uh, a non-planar surface, as you see here uh, in, the, in the cut drawing. And uh, it will also help us to understand how to, to feed this information then into system codes for more um, comprehensive analysis. So you see there are a lot of um, challenges to solve uh, when we want to, to address some problem like this with CFD and I, I briefly want to um, highlight how we approach this uh, with, with containment foam. Just to say it's, um, it's a coordinated R&D effort so um, we try to develop all the things having the big picture in mind. It's not like uh, individual pieces here and there that we can plug and play, but uh, you will see later we will really have to interact uh, with uh, the different models uh, that we are doing. It's a multi-scale application, and to some extent it's also multi-physics application, as you will see later. And it's very important, I will stress that uh, a couple of times, is that if you do such an analysis, there's no way of simplifying the problem isolating a single piece of physics, but you really have to do all of these things to be representative. So in this way, let's say the whole or the, the system model itself, it is uh, as strong as the weakest element, and um, that means, let's say, the slowest model determines the time we are running, and the um, coarsest model, of course, will determine the accuracy of the whole result. So this is something to be addressed in the model set. We came up with a baseline set of models, so you will see containment form has not too many models at all, but all the things we have, um, they are there for a good reason, and we're trying to understand limitations of those models rather than optimizing them for a very specific purpose. 
Having this limited set, we can give a better guidance. We can limit our maintenance efforts. So again, we will not put everything that's available into the code, but we will stick to um, something that's, to our opinion, the most uh, useful um, model set. And also we came across the point that um, there are many things which are done by everyone. It's repetitive, um, something like case setup, uh, monitoring and evaluating a solution. So we provided some tools or we are developing within containment form some tools to, um, to ease this process and implement a certain set of standards. So there are common post-processing functions for the basic things like heat and mass balance. Um, there are recommendations for data handling, uh, minimizing uh, I.O. And also we are working on, on a framework to um, quantify uncertainties within the validation runs. So that these sort of things, they are standardized and uh, repeated. If you look at the phenomenology, we discussed uh, the one or the other thing here is uh, what you see clearly if you look at the containment is uh, it's a very complex three-dimensional geometry, multi-compartmented. Um, some of the compartments, they are separated by doors and burst disks, so these sort of things can open during a transient and form new flow paths. And also we have a wide range of uh, lengths and time scales coming from the system as it all uh, down to the physics um, that we are solving. Similarly, on the phenomenological side, there are many things to consider. Um, we are going through a broad range of flow regimes. If we really start with the blowdown, um, can end up at very slow flows, uh, which are primarily driven by local differences in density. And then there can be even stagnant uh, zones in, in the um, containment. So there are a lot of physical phenomena interacting um, with themselves, but also with the system feedback. So the effectiveness of uh, passive safety features, uh, for example. Again, to be loud here, if we want to discuss all these things, there's no way of um, simplifying the problem too strongly. We, we really have to consider all of these things in the model. So I, I wanted to brainstorm a bit, but I will be fast on this to save some time. Uh, there are a lot of things that will affect the containment atmosphere, uh, flows and mixing, the, let's say, um, a change of temperature, composition, which induces buoyancy, and also the, the pressure, the heat and mass balance. And just to give a few things I had in mind, uh, of course, this is heat transfer, heat exchange with all the structures in the containment. Um, this is uh, heat transfer within the atmosphere, primarily thermal radiation. Uh, these are safety features like uh, passive autocatalytic recombiners, containment coolers, which are in many um, things. Uh, they can be sprinklers. Uh, we have these um, doors and burst disks, which will heavily affect the flow pattern uh, when they open. Uh, we have operator actions, some logic, something like if you reach that certain pressure, activate the venting system uh, that needs to be um, considered. And we have a lot of input from uh, the primary system, which is not part of containment form. It's simply as an input from, uh, from a system code, something like the, the steam release rates, um, evaporation from sums. So you will see containment form is single phase, so we are not, um, not modeling accumulation of water. We just take it from the system side. Heat losses from the reactor cooling system components, heat and mass release from molten core and concrete interaction. These are things we, we cannot do, we just rely on, on uh, external input. Of course, all this is linked with the atmospheric mixing processes, but also there are some interdependencies uh, of the models. So simply to say, um, bulk condensation, fogging, and aerosol transport are very, very tightly linked. Um, and at the end, this will also drive then the distribution of the decay heat, um, the fission products in the containment atmosphere, which will induce buoyancy locally, drive the mixing processes. But there are other things like radiation um, and fogging. This will um, affect each other. Uh, the safety systems like SPA, they could evaporate um, the fog, which is formed uh, somewhere. So at the end, there are a lot of dependencies between the models, where the models have to talk to each other provide their output as an input to the others. We put this together in a set of models. Uh, as you see here, I won't go to all the details, but um, at the end we, we defined a baseline model for all these um, different phenomena. Uh, the green check marks are simply saying this is within the release version we have for the moment. The yellow ones is something that's still under work and will uh, follow um, soon.
So to summarize, containment foam is a package which um, contains some tailored solvers for, um, let's say, fluid only and conjugate heat transfer solver, uh, solutions. And also we are now putting this um, two-phase volume of fluid method solver here. Um, we have a library of application-oriented models which are really tailored for a specific, um, let's say, um, thermofluid dynamic conditions and, and applications. We have um, done quite some verification and validation. Unfortunately, we cannot share the validation cases since all the data is somewhat proprietary, but at least the verification is um, part of the repository. And we have set up a framework for collaborative um, development, um, for collaborative use of uh, the code that I will show at the end. Uh, when designing containment foam, we um, designed it not to be standalone part. It's um, an add-on to open foam version 9 at the moment. It will be version 11, hopefully within half a year. Um, and we, we did this in two ways. The first one was simply uh, what Carlo mentioned yesterday, uh, identifying an interesting model in the code, cloning it, and then uh, changing it so that we have a new version of it. And the other one was creating um, separate uh, base classes that will um, provide us functionality that was not there in open form before, something like multi-species transport or condensation. And while we did this, we were pretty careful um, implementing uh, a number of plausibility checks. So if you run it and you will get a lot of errors and the code doesn't want to start, this is simply because we did all these checks to guide the user and prevent that things are done which are inconsistent uh, with respect to the design of the models. So for example, here you see that we, we check a combination of boundary conditions just to make sure that someone who wants to run um, condensation <coughs> does not forget to specify uh, the, the right boundary conditions for all. all of Those um, base classes, they, um, and also their derivatives, they hold a number of access functions which you can simply call in the, the equation stand, something like here. Uh, for example, we get the diffusion coefficients from the, the library. We can get the condensation rates from uh, the, the class and add this as a new source term, for example, to, to the equation. Okay, with this I will quickly jump into uh, the theory and we can run through this pretty fast, uh, I would say. Um, but before I come to the physics, uh, I would have a very short uh, excourse to the um, geometric modeling of the containment. I mean, a major feature driving the flow is more or less the geometry of the containment. It's super complex, and at the end, we need to consider this uh, in the geometric model. But on the other hand, it's pretty clear the more details, the more features we involve in the geometry, the harder it will be to, to run this, and the more um, expensive the um, computations will be. So, to give you some idea on how to approach this, um, we take the geometry here, we specify a kind of a maximum edge length, this is a half a meter in this case, so the large cells you see uh, here in the bulk region. And um, then we, we specify refinement levels to resolve the, uh, the structures within the containment. So, a refinement means we are cutting a cubic cell into four. So you can imagine by refining we rapidly increase the number of cells. So I would not go more than two refinement levels. That means my smallest cell has an edge length of 12.2 uh, centimeters. And if I imagine I need at least two cells to resolve a structure, then this means the, the geometric feature um, length that I can resolve is 25 centimeters. So this is pretty large actually for a CFD simulation. If I do this uh, feature resolving, you see it um, here, for example, then that means that I get a lot of small cells close to the features. And again, when I then want to extrude boundary layers to uh, also resolve the flow near the, the walls, something like you see here, I would just extrude those small faces I have into the bulk. So this will multiply up again the number of cells. So you can imagine that coming up with a, a usable mesh here is um, really a balance between a lot of different uh, things to consider. And um, in this particular example here, uh, I came up with something like six million cells for um, the, the fluid phase of the containment. So this is, I would say, pretty coarse looking at the phenomenology, but this is already something that is um, challenging for running transient uh, analysis. 
So we need to find models that can somehow handle uh, those uh, kind of coarse um, grids. So at the end, we are trying to reduce the number of equations to be solved. We are going for single phase. We try to neglect all those um, liquid parts. We are using Rand's equations, not going for something fancy like LES. Um, we use wall functions near the walls to um, prevent a high boundary layer resolution. We try to add effects that we cannot solve with the simple modeling into the um, um, Rand's equations. We have um, the, the tracers like fog or aerosols, they are simply passive scalars transported along with the flow. And wherever we have um, very specific things like system models, we, we try to use um, a coarse approach, either porous media or some system coupling to, to represent all this. <clears throat> and you can imagine if you resolve the containment with, uh, let's say, a characteristic length of 25 centimeters, you will lose a lot of structures walking grids, uh, handrails, all these things, pipings, uh, a lot of heat capacity that we have that will condense steam and, and prevent um, pressurization. So at this point, all these things um, have to be con uh, considered somehow in, in a porous media approach. There's no way of, of uh, neglecting these things. Good. So um, quickly go through the models. Um, we took a basic solver reacting form in, uh, that was available with open form. We extended it by uh, multi-species treatment, so primarily adding molecular diffusion here. Doing so, you, you have to know that there will be another term coming up in the energy equation, which um, accounts for the, the enthalpy, which is diffused by um, the diffusive mass flux here. And then we added some source terms, which will, um, let's say, be used to integrate the one or the other model. Um, we set up a solver algorithm, which is close to um, what, what reacting foam was doing, but at the end, we, um, we had also to integrate all the models that we, that we will link. And we do this in an implicit manner, so mostly the models are integrated and updated within the, the pimple loop. A specific thing here when it comes to multi-species flows is that actually the density is um, in any equation, and um, it will change by nearly any equation. So it will change when we update continuity, it will change when we update our species concentrations, it will change when we update the temperature field, and it will again change when we update the pressure field. So we need to iterate around this a couple of times, meaning um, a piece of approach is not possible, we have to go for pimple. Um, we defined the baseline set of numerical settings. I will not go into detail on this, but if you look at our test cases, you will find that these EPI solutions, EPI schemes, they are always looking the same. Uh, this is a, a kind of consensus we had to make sure that um, somehow these um, considerations are not um, leading to some user effects in the validation. We put in some nice feature for um, for system analysis, which I would like to highlight here, this is a, a kind of extended time-stepping management. So actually what OpenFoam does is looking at the current number to reduce or increase the time step. And um, this is a posteriori treatment, so it will simply check what happened in the time step before and adjust the, the current, um, current time stepping. There's one issue with it, meaning a large time step does not mean a fast simulation. So technically you can have a large time step with many internal iterations, or you can go for a small time step with less internal iterations, and in some the latter is faster. So what we added was checking the number of pimple iterations, the inner iterations we need, and by this also adjust the time step. And again, this is something that happens a posteriori. So whenever the convergence was not good enough, it will reduce uh, the time step. But of course, we already did this um, convergence issues uh, in, our, uh, in our solution. So the idea was to, um, to have some kind of um, trigger where um, our system models can tell the code something will happen very soon, reduce your time step. Something like a burst disk will open. So this will rapidly change the, the flow situation from a stagnant or close to stagnant flow to something that is uh, very fast. So um, in this point we can change already before this event happens the time step to a small value and then come back uh, afterwards to this automatic treatment. And last but not least, if you shoot a simulation, it's not, usually it's not fire and forget, it's, um, 
you start it, you have to monitor it, and of course when it crashes, this is a loss of, uh, of computation time. So here we added another feature saying um, that if a time step is not converging, um, redo it with a smaller time step size. So this will help us to um, prevent any kind of crashes that, uh, that may happen during runtime. And um, we put in these controls into the, the control dig. Is there a question? No. So we put in these um, controls into the control dict and tested it on a quite typical transient. I will come to this later. It's a, it's a pressurization transient um, over 20,000 seconds. We are running here. Uh, again, another international standard problem. And if we do this with uh, the classical treatment and the improved one, what you actually will see is the, the classical treatment here in red. It runs partially on a larger time scale. So you see here the curve is straightly going up. Um, but it often reaches the maximum number of uh, tolerable pimple iterations. While if we choose this uh, new treatment, we will uh, often have a smaller time step, like here and here but it will remain at a low number of pimple iterations. And at the end, we do more time step integrations, but we reduce the runtime simply because we are converging um, better than before. And uh, this will, let's say, lead to some savement of uh, computing time, but also, of course, getting a more accurate solution since we are not exceeding our convergence limits here. I told you the case of the burst disks. So, um, we have the system events created by the user or by the system models themselves, simply uh, reducing the time step, keeping it on a low level, and then giving control back to the time step management. And again, here we see that this is very beneficial in such um, system scale analysis. As you see on this simple example, so when we run here, um, pressurizing uh, the first chamber, um, we can run on a pretty large time step. And then when the um, the burst disk fails, the time step will be re reduced quickly. Um, if you do it by the current number, we can easily go up to current number of 400, 500. Um, and uh, then we will have this fast flow, which is equilibrating pressure between both um, volumes. And you see here on, on this uh, pressure plot, if we do it with the current number, we accept this one time step with a high numerical error, we will end up with a different pressure at the end. So this is an indicator for a problem with the mass balance. While if we use uh, the treatment here, you will see that um, actually we can much better capture uh, the reference results, um, however, at a somewhat larger cost. So doing this is, of course, something one has to adapt carefully, but um, we will put this, or we have put this into uh, our solution monitor set so that the, the time stepping um, strategy can be, can be monitored and adapted according to the run. So we'll not talk too much about uh, the physics of modeling turbulence. Just tell you um, we are adding some source terms here into the equations. You find it in the source code in a very simple way, just adding this function, which um, at the end um, allows us to compute the source term based on the model that we select in the dictionaries, either simple or generalized gradient diffusion hypothesis, and then return this value into the turbulence model. So. Um, not too tough to, um, to add this. I will jump over this. Um, for condensing flows, I said we did a simplification which is reasonable for large dry containments. It's not so reasonable for the small uh, and modular reactor containments. But what you assume here is we have a lot of non-condensable gases that will practically um, pose the, the strongest transport resistance um, of steam to the wall or to the uh, condensing interface. So here we can model condensation rates simply as a diffusion process, let's say from the bulk to the interface. And the challenge here is um, modeling the turbulent diffusivity. This is done using wall functions. Um, you will see everywhere in CFD people using wall functions and um, this is very um, important for, for that kind of application since this will directly affect the condensation rates that are predicted. So the wall function does nothing else than linking the value at the face, our saturation condition, to the value at the cell center. And it is not doing this by prescribing a value, but prescribing a flux. 
So in open form, this is done by adopting the, um, the turbulent diffusivity um, to match these kind of analytical profiles that are um, specified in, in the wall functions. So we can get the turbulent diffusivity from the wall function. And of course, for condensing wall, we don't have to do this just for the species. We have to do it for temperature, for velocity, for turbulence, and so on. So there's a set of um, wall functions to be applied um, along with the condensation model in order to make uh, this kind of model work. Um, <clears throat> another example um, for open foam, uh, for let's say the, the ease of putting a model into open foam. If you do it, implement such a model in a, in a commercial software, what you typically do is add a source term to the governing equations. Um, that's straightforward, but at the end it does not really reflect uh, the physics. So you can imagine if this is a large cell, things happening at the cell center where you evaluate the source terms are different than things on the face where the flux originally is. So what we did in, in containment form was simply putting the flux on the wall, on the face. This is nice because it appears as a convective term in the matrix. It's not a source term, it's an implicit treatment. And we simply model all the processes uh, on the boundary itself. So um, again to highlight, these models, they, they just work if you follow a very um, specific way of specifying all related uh, boundaries um, for that patch where condensation uh, works. We validated it. It was um, giving us good results. And I, I just want to conclude on this with an example of the ISP 47 again. Um, if you use wall functions and your mesh is too coarse, um, your turbulent diffusivities will be wrong, or let's say not correct enough, and uh, this may happen uh, if it's to cause that you underestimate or overestimate condensation rates. Here, um, in these phases where high condensation is occurring, uh, you may overestimate uh, the condensation rates significantly. So be aware of these errors and try to, um, to understand this by visualizing, for example, the Y plus values. So jump over to um, fogging. So actually what we do is we um, take another simple model of thermal equilibrium assumption. We homogenize the fog in a cell. We use it or we transport it as a passive scalar. And we use a very simple model. It's the return to saturation, a constant time scale model to um, predict the condensation or evaporation rates. So we simply adopt our concentrations uh, to match the saturation state in each cell. So fog is then transported, again, um, by, a, um, by a means of a passive scalar. Here it's the fog volume fraction. And um, we allow the fog to drift relative to our mean flow, to the gas flow, um, based on this drift velocity term, which is just resulting from uh, the fog, uh, from the forces like um, drag or, or gravity. So it's not tough to implement such a model. Um, what we see at the end of the day, there's one parameter we have to give as an input. This is the diameter of the fog droplets. And it's very hard in a, in a let's say, transient analysis to spe specify a constant diameter. So um, what we went forward was to, um, to add a simple population balance model, some piece of software available in open form. We just put it into our framework um, to to model also the growth and shrinkage of these um, fog droplets. So actually what we do is we have the size distribution of fog. We um, separate it into bins with a specific representative volume and some interval around it. And then we have source terms that will um, account for the coalescence of fog droplets, so small droplets forming a larger ones, and also the change of the, um, the bin due to evaporation condensation. And we solve a number of um, these transport equations then for um, each of those volume intervals. So this is um, giving us a quite physical representation. It's slightly more expensive, but it's giving us a physical representation. As you see here in this experiment, we're injecting hot steam in a cold environment. We form a lot of fog in the area where it is um, injected. The fog has a small diameter. And while it is settling down in the facility, the fog drops are, are growing in size and, um, and then settling down in the lower part of the facility. And if you look simply at the pressure, you will see the red curve here. This gives us the most 
consistent representation um, of uh, the heat and mass balance here. Um, we are going forward, as said, for smaller modular reactors, putting this into mm -hmm. our volume of fluid method, um, or integrating that method in, in our uh, solvers. And you see the same experiment here in a two-phase treatment. Um, so you see the, the phase fraction of uh, fog here, and uh, in the lower part, in the sump region of the facility, the, the fog uh, being accumulated and forming uh, this, this uh, sump. <coughs> When it comes to this, I would say fog is not too much important for the water steam balance, but it is very important for transport of aerosols. And I would like to give one example here um, uh, related to the, the release of decay heat by the aerosol particles. So um, when we talk about aerosols, actually we have the same physics like for fog, but we uh, add up some other forces like thermo diffuso and uh, turbophoresis and we have some other mechanisms that will uh, change the uh, the size of our particles like uh, hygroscopic growth so um, when we put these models together and um, we were running another um, validation experiment so this is a, a same the the same test vessel there's a cooled wall a heated wall which will cause some natural circulation and the steam injection in the upper part we run this with uh, without considering decay heat and with considering decay heat. And uh, you will see that the mixing behavior in both cases, it changes significantly, right? So this is something that we can investigate, understand analytically using such a tool. It is impossible to do this on an experimental side. No one would like to put radioactive material in his test facility. Um, that's a, a huge effort, but this, kind of analyzes it, gives us some insights uh, on the interactions uh, of, uh, of the different flows and the mixing process. So you see with decay heat, the mixing seems to be faster, but still the atmosphere is more stratified as we have it here in the case um, without decay heat. So this is an important <coughs> feature here, and um, we are currently harmonizing all this together in one library, and uh, as soon as this is done, um, also appear in the uh, in the release version and the idea here is actually to um, consider fog as an aerosol if it's just fog it will be um, as it is but if it becomes an aerosol mixture we will compute the mixture properties of the aerosol first and then transport it either in a mono dispersed approach or with this population balance model solving uh, the number of transport equations um, briefly on radiation uh, we saw this is a very important phenomenon in containment analysis as it affects the gas temperature. Gas temperature means also saturation pressure of steam, means water steam balance, flammability. All these features are somewhat associated with it. And if we neglect it, um, we typically um, predict a too hot atmosphere. So this is really important since radiation um, can transfer energy over a longer distance without having a flow while for convection you just need the flow, you need the temperature gradients to um, transfer energy. Um, I will be fast. There are a number of models in open foam that can do that. The discrete ordinate method, the um, P1 or spherical harmonics method. Um, they have all their pros and cons. At the end, um, P1, it seemed too simple for us. It's too diffusive, um, FVDOM. It was accurate enough, but it suffers a bit from this kind of uh, spatial discretization, um, and it's also very expensive if you go for a multiband um, model for the spectral properties. So our way was to integrate a Monte Carlo solver um, into it, which is quite useful when it comes to complex geometries, and also if you want to go for um, spectral modeling of uh, radiation, simply since you can sample photons uh, with their initial energy, which um, is much more effective than uh, running uh, an equation for each energy band. So, um, yeah, I will leave these slides for you for studying yourself. What I should say is we um, developed this Monte Carlo um, solver based on the Lagrangian library in open form. So simply similar to tracking particles, we track photons with the difference that photons will not interact with each other. They are traveling, um, let's say from the source to their um, final target within one time step. And um, we can treat them in a somewhat different way than, uh, than particles.
So we implemented a number of uh, improved methods to reduce variance. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting, but uh, no time to go into much details uh, on this side. Um, what I should say is, was much work done to parallelize all this um, to make the method as efficient as possible, in particular the, the parallel treatment of um, photon transport. So here we used a lot of those things that are also done on, on the neutron transport side. Um, we use, similar to what we saw in Genform yesterday, different meshes to compute radiation transport and um, fluid motion and we map the information between both meshes so that we can also optimize uh, the runtime. Uh, we use a multiband model um, to prescribe all the properties um, of the, the variable mixtures, um, the low temperatures we are having. Um, again, you see in the um, dictionaries uh, how all those different modeling options that we have put can be specified in a very clear, uh, clear manner. So the last thing I want to come to is uh, modeling of uh, technical systems, which is very high importance for, for such an application. Um, we already talked about uh, burst disks or doors, um, passive autocatalytic recombiners, any kind of containment cooling systems. Um, any structures that are distributed, sprinklers, um, containment venting systems, pressure suppression systems, emergency injection systems, and so on. So there are many of them, and we have to find a way to get them into uh, the CFD domain, either um, by using porous media, by specifying specific boundary conditions, by putting some point sources, or let's say some um, distributed source terms, and so on. So, um, yeah, this is just a, a view back to reality. Um, if you walk through a containment, it looks like this. If you look into an experimental facility, it looks like this. If we model it, it's just an empty volume. So we need to find a way to, to account for all these small scale structures. And the way to go is a porous medium, right? I will not detail on this. Carlo did it very well yesterday. Um, just to say that there's a different way than changing the governing equations. There's a function object in open form which will simply apply source terms in the equations. So we will not account for the blockage of part of the volume. We will simply uh, add their effect to the equations. So um, this is um, a very flexible way of doing it and I, I would like to, to showcase um, this um, by one example. So we can specify such a porosity source, it's called in open form, by selecting uh, a number of cells, a cell zone. We um, can specify the Darcy and Forshammer coefficients. We can give, uh, let's say, a specify a streamwise direction and a cross streamwise direction. Um, so by this we can also change, let's say, the resistance in different flow directions by a very um, short snippet of, uh, of model. We can do this, um, of course, also in a um, porous conjugate heat transfer simulation. So we can have a heat transfer between two different meshes, one porous domain on the fluid side, one on the um, solid side. We can um, use other source terms to um, consider things like uh, turbulence damping due to a porous structure. And with this, we can run a simulation uh, like what you see here. So this was a benchmark test we did um, in, a, in a project where they had a jet flow impinging on an inclined walking grid, being somewhat diverted, and then mixing some uh, light gas layer. And you see on the left side, this is the flow we predict by resolving uh, the, the walking grid, something like three and a half million cells. And on the right side, you see the flow we are modeling, simply with a porous medium, and 800,000 uh, grid cells. And you can see more or less that the results are pretty comparable. So we can speed up a lot the simulation by using such, uh, such kind of models and also represent things that may not be neglected. Uh, we can do the same for heat exchangers. Uh, we'll skip it. Um, and uh, I also said we, we have a model for burst disks, which is a, a trick that OpenForm gives us. So OpenForm has a functionality called baffles that uh, are practically uh, boundary conditions that can be connected uh, in some kind of way. So we have a zero thickness 
wall in a, in a mesh, and we can describe what happens between both sides of, uh, of this wall. And what we do actually to mimic a burst disk is we create um, two of those baffles, one which is open, one which is closed, and we have a condition that switches between both. So a very straightforward thing. The only thing we have to do is a lot of mesh manipulation in the beginning to create these sets of, um, of faces that will represent uh, the same thing. Um, if we do it, we have in each file again um, the conditions for um, the open face and the conditions for the closed face. So it's uh, not a difficult thing. In addition, of course, we have the burst disk telling uh, our solver and the time step management when it will open and all these things. Uh, um, for modern technical systems, Again, we can come back to porous media. I will show that on example of passive autocatalytic recombiners, but we can also go for um, system coupling. Again, show this uh, on this, this example. What is such a recombiner? Um, it's actually um, a catalyst module here in terms of sheets, but they can also have porous materials where hydrogen and oxygen can react to form steam without a flame. So it's a way to get rid of the hydrogen in the containment and um, prevent any kind of uh, combustion risk. So this is a passive device. That means there's no electricity driving it. And if you want to know how efficient it is, you have to do some analysis and really consider the position of the um, recombiner with respect to the flow in the containment. So it's a multi-scale issue again. These catalysts have a thickness of some milli, uh, micrometers. Um, the spacing between is centimeters. The whole thing is one meter, and it's in a 50-meter diameter containment. So at the end, um, it's impossible to do this completely in CFD, and we have to find some kind of a um, coarser treatment. And um, you can do this with porous media, as it's shown here, using empirical correlations. That's not my favorite way of doing it. Um, what we did, we linked some uh, standalone code we had in our institute um, as a detailed model into um, containment form. So this code has a lot of different physics for analyzing the operational characteristics of this device, and it provides us the um, relevant variables as boundary conditions. So there are different ways of doing this coupling. I won't jump too much into it. Uh, just to say is what we do is we decompose the domain, so we cut out the internal part of this recombiner. We use an explicit coupling scheme here, knowing that the recombiner is a very slow acting, it's a thermal device, so at the end this is the, the easiest way to implement it and also the most uh, simple one. But depending on what you do uh, with the, the models, of course, there are other strategies to follow. Uh, Semi-implicit coupling, uh, you may go for let's say, subcycling of the one or the other code, um, meeting at some synchronization points, and so on. So we use a feature available in open form that's called external coupled. So it's a file-based coupler. We write out the, the coupling conditions to a file which is read by the external code. We do some Python around it to um, make sure the data handling and all the logistics work. And then we can couple any kind of executable um, that we have into the code. And just to show that this is um, giving us useful, um, useful capabilities, we run some uh, validation case here, um, a transient of uh, 14,000 seconds in this uh, 60 cubic meter test facility where uh, different gases are injected in the bottom. We have this recombiner mounted on the outer side. And um, if you walk through, you can see that we, with this coupled system, are able to compute on the one hand, what's happening with the recombiner, so for example, the flow rate in the recombiner, but we can also um, very well get the, the overall heat and mass balance in, in the vessel. And all this at a relatively moderate cost of simply running CFD on the atmospheric mixing processes, but not on the device itself. Um, there's another approach, and uh, I will be very brief on this since uh, Carl will present it this uh, yeah, very soon on his poster. This is a coupling containment form to a kind of system code which is called the Open Modelica. So this is a modeling language that is designed to study engineering systems. There are a lot of libraries for different components one can link together to mimic the one or the other uh, technical system. The nice thing here is Modelica can export what's called a functional mockup unit, so a kind of exportable 
a model that we can link following another standard is the functional mockup interface uh, with any kind of other code and also in this case um, uh, with containment form. So what Carl did was actually um, creating a, an interface between containment form and uh, the um, functional mockup interface by um, using some functionality that was available, FMU for form, and adding some extras like a semi-implicit coupling, uh, subcycling of the FMU, restarting of the FMU, and so on. And we built some, some models that can uh, mimic, uh, in our case, it was a pressure suppression system for this, this iris concept I mentioned in the beginning and uh, packaged it in a FMU so we could link this uh, to, to containment form. And, uh, just to show you how this uh, looks like in reality, we have uh, the, uh, again, coupling dictionary in open form. We have this um, simple system model which solves the constitutive equations, the balances, and all some initial conditions. We put this together uh, at a coupling interface and, um, and then through in this uh, validation example, uh, a transient where, um, uh, let's say, steam non condensing gases are purged into a pressure suppression system. And if you look at the results, um, in particular in the, in the pressurization here, we, we see uh, the phenomenology we were expecting, a pressure increase when the non condensable gases are purged and a slower pressure increase when more or less only steam is purged which can condense in the, uh, in the water. So this is a really flexible way of doing things and uh, it will be the future where we go. We will try to package this recombiner model also as a functional mock-up unit and uh, focus more on getting additional system models uh, into containment. So with this I have a few minutes left to, to show you um, how to get started with containment form, what are the, um, the resources available, which kind of helper tools we provide you and then I will conclude uh, for today. Um, if you go to the repository, you will uh, find all those things uh, typically used uh, for software engineering. It's a uh, version control management. You can jump back the different versions we did, see what we changed. Um, it holds um, conjugate, uh, con continuous integration environments, so we are running test cases every update we do to make sure results are not changing. There's a ticket system you can use in case you observe problems. You can also send emails, of course. Um, and if you want to get involved, uh, of course, we can uh, get you in via um, using your GitHub account. Um, we put a lot of documentation into um, markdown files. So it holds um, links to uh, source code, links to examples, uh, figures, and so on, showing um, the uh, solver, the governing equations we are solving, uh, some details on the models, um, some technical modeling, standard boundary condition types we are using, material properties, uh, numerical methods, uh, references to our work, um, some useful helper tools we have, some ideas on how to do troubleshooting, um, some ideas on what we are working on at the moment um, that may come up soon, and also a change log that will tell us um, what was changed, whether it was a minor change, uh, a major change that should require, let's say, some reevaluation of test cases on your end or whether it was a bug fix that fixes something. So this information is given in, in the change log. In a similar fashion, um, like Carlo showed yesterday, we put all this together with some source code documentation on um, a Doxygen page, which is also hosted in the repository. So uh, you can see this in line with uh, the source code. Um, and last but not least, if you need information, it's always a good way to, to look in the header files of, um, of the um, models. You will find, uh, again, literature references here, a kind of representation of the equations that are solved, and so on. Um, looking at the test cases, you will see they are organized in a similar way like the models. So we will have, more or less for each model, a, a specific test case. There is a run script, uh, often it's called all run, sometimes it's called run case, when it holds some uh, specific arguments to, to specify the case. There is some reference data, post-processing, so you can easily walk through this process to get an idea on how to use the features and, and test the code. Um, yeah, last word on if you want to contribute, um, 
please uh, collaborate with us. Don't take the code, create your fork, uh, do something with it, maybe publish it somewhere else. Uh, this will just dilute all the efforts and it's better to, um, to get integrated um, in the team. So first step is of course get in touch with us. Um, check on our guidelines that we have for contributions um, and then there are two ways. Either you share your code, it will be integrated, or you create an add-on to containment form that we can link um, and just refer to your own personal repository. If there's a bug, please uh, get in touch with us. Um, anything you feel should be done in a better way is a very valuable feedback for us. And also if you think there is some functionality missing for a specific case, this would be also a good feedback for us. Briefly on two helper tools we have. So I, I showed you that all those dictionaries, they hold a lot of keywords, uh, some specifics for the models that we need to know and also put in the right, uh, right way. So a lot of things have been done by people developing this for years and they put these keywords with a very specific purpose and it's not so easy to take the banana method, just get the availability of all keywords and then put some. This is um, probably not the good way. Um, the other thing is that if we look at such a case setup, if we add a model, for example, um, here, it may happen that we have to modify several files. And often, if we forget one file, this will not lead that the simulation will crash or not start. It just may happen that the, the simulation is inconsistent, incomplete. And um, we also see that everyone is doing somewhat what is uh, his experience, changing numerical schemes, um, and all these things. So at the end, comparing simulation, it, it became a very difficult. So at the end, our approach was to, um, to create a kind of guidance to, to set up a base case. This can serve as a reference for your own changes, for your own things, but at the end, we always have a common setup we can uh, refer to. Just to give an example, um, here, if you want to add radiation, you have to specify different boundary conditions. You have to go through the uh, system code coupling um, to add, uh, for example, fork um, if you put this into uh, the model list. So all these things can easily be forgotten and then you lack this term in uh, the coupling. So um, just to say we developed this kind of guided uh, user workflow to set up a case. Um, it's a Java based thing simply since it's developed by software developing trainees who learned this from the very first day of uh, their studies. Um, which will guide you in a logical manner through this uh, workflow. So um, at the end we have a lot of templated dictionaries behind that allow you to choose the one or the other model and there are a lot of rules that will help you to not do the wrong decisions uh, and come up with an inconsistent specification. So we have different ways to import mesh for multiple regions. Um, we have templated properties or calculators that allow you to uh, get the material data. We have um, model templates so that you can easily set up uh, on the various models, simple uh, drag down menus. Um, all of this is done in, in a very consistent way to open form so that you can easily navigate between the dictionary file and these uh, steps here. Uh, we have uh, ways to specify the system models. So all this mesh manipulation for the burst disk, it's done in the background. Um, we have templates for initial and boundary conditions. You can import CSV files, table editors. You can have global variables. Um, we have a fixed set of um, uh, solver methods and um, schemes, and uh, also some predefined function objects. So with this, it's very easy to create based on a mesh case um, and keep this as a reference for further um, developments. Just a, a, a trick here is, um, you can use a tool called Melt or any kind of other um, tool that allows you to diff text and you can quickly visualize changes between these kind of reference setup uh, that you created with the, the GUI and the, the version you developed on your own on uh, this basis. So it's good to keep this as a reference and come back later. The last thing I would like to showcase is the solution monitor. So in OpenFOAM you will come up with a lot of text logs which are um, really comprehensive but it's impossible to follow uh, this on runtime. So the thing we need actually um, to go through the solver log, uh, the function output, uh, function object output, the coupled code logs is 
we need some kind of visualization scheme. And uh, we put this solution monitor you see here, which can visualize all this in terms of graphs. Um, it can stream any kind of lock, even non-open form locks uh, are, are possible. Um, it can have tapped or grid view, um, open different runs at the same uh, time. Uh, and we use some, some uh, filters or regular expression syntax to grab the information from those, um, those log files. So anything that's not available here can be easily added and um, make this a, a useful thing. And there are a number of filters like uh, fast Fourier transformation if you want to see periodicity, for example, moving averages and so on that will help you to um, analyze the results. It now works also on uh, remote systems using SSH. You can stream the log files. And um, I think it's a very useful thing for any kind of simulation to, to be aware of what's happening while the simulation is run. Brings me to the end. Uh, I showed you, I think, a quite comprehensive toolbox um, that we developed for um, any kind of containment phenomena, in particular pressurization, combustion risk, aerosol behavior. It's done to support experiments, um, to investigate interactions of phenomena that we cannot do on the experimental side, and also to assess uh, effectiveness of passive safety systems. It's um, a tailored and well-integrated model basis for the expected conditions. If we go beyond, of course, we have to um, extend this. Uh, it holds physical models, but also a number of um, system models that we can use to, to represent that feedback. And um, of course, the future way will be to uh, move away from this classical dry P uh, PWR containments towards uh, smaller modular reactors, which a bunch of new challenges and, and physics. I also showed briefly a summary of some best practices and um, standard procedures um, that you can find on the repository within these tools um, that will help you as a starting point. And just to uh, give you some task if you like to, so there is no official hands-on. But uh, I often mention this ISP47 test case. Um, it's a, let's say, a fast-running transient you can do in one and a half day simulation time, more or less. Uh, I will share after this uh, lecture the setup with you. But um, you will find the paper um, on NED. And uh, you can easily set this up in containment form and run the transient if you're interested. It's not too difficult using the GUI, maybe 15 minutes to collect all things together and I, I once run through and then one and a half days runtime so that you um, can end up with some kind of evaluation like uh, what I showed you. That's it. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Stefan, for the great lecture. Perfectly in time also. Now we are open for the questions, comments here and from online. <coughs> No? Can I have a question? Yeah, sure, please. Um, a few of them, actually. Well, one is the short one. Uh, what tool to use for meshing? Um, we have CF Mesh Plus, so this is the commercial version of the open source uh, um, CF Mesh, which is something like Snappy X Mesh, but with an enhanced treatment for wall boundary layers. So this is super important. It has. Uh, um, Graphical user interface? Yeah, it also has a graphical user interface, yeah. Is it a, find it's a good tool? Have you compared it like with tools from ANSYS or? Yeah, I'm, I'm personally an ISIM user, which is a very old tool, I but very ISIM. powerful for structured meshes uh, that I use for structured ones. And for unstructured meshing, I, I use CF mesh. That's, that's the thing. Okay. And I have another one. Um, so your tool is, uh, is is extremely detailed, and uh, out there there are tools that are much less detailed, like Gothic. And I feel like with your tool, you have the possibility to transition gradually to a, from a very accurate to a non-accurate kind of solution, mm -hmm. because in principle, tools like Gothic use a K-epsilon model on a coarse mesh, which is something you would be able to do. So you would have the same capabilities. Have you ever tried to do a kind of a study of using your own tool to transition from high accuracy to low accuracy. Or, or I, I shouldn't I, say accuracy, from yeah. low detail to high detail and see the, the effect of being detailed. I think we, we had this idea in mind, but um, we didn't plan to replicate uh, Gothic. So at the end, 
I think the, the application case of such a tool is really having these details and providing feedback to coarser tools. So um, it may happen that we will integrate the one or the other coarse mesh feature to go a bit in this direction, but I would not try to uh, mimic uh, the Gothic approach in, in containment form. How different is the Gothic approach? Because uh, isn't it just kind of a coarse way of doing the same thing in the same equations, it's k epsilon, I think? As but they, okay, they have a lot of empirics um, okay. for the, uh, I mean, they use correlations for pressure drop, for um, nozzle numbers, uh, shovel numbers, these sort of things. Ah, okay. okay. So it, I would say it's closer to uh, gen form. Okay. Okay, thank you. We have a question from uh, the online, from Asama al -Azaten. First, he asks if you will send the files to the, drop, to the Dropbox. For sure, I will do. Yeah. Okay. And another question, did you compare the results of a given simulation with other CV excellent codes like Relab SCADAP? If yes, are the results approximately similar? So have you maybe here, more extended about yeah. validation? Here, here and there, yes. So I didn't show validation results simply since uh, many of those experiments, they are somewhat proprietary, uh, link, limited to a certain group, so I, I didn't add it. And generally, we um, often compare among the CFD codes that I use and uh, less compare um, system code and, and um, CFD code. But there have been benchmarks. Um, you will find some references uh, for sure in the, in the reference list where both have been uh, compared. And here and there, of course, uh, Due to the fundamental difference in the model formulation, you will see uh, that CFD will give some extra, but um, for generic cases like pressurization, it's more or less the same. Okay, thank you. I mean in the radiation model? Actually, we use uh, this. Please repeat the question so yeah. people are Okay, okay. Yeah, it was asked how we do the uh, mapping of the mesh. I have to scroll back to that specific thing. Here. So it is a similar thing like uh, what uh, Carlo presented yesterday. So we have uh, two different meshes, one for the, uh, for the fluid flow and one for the radiation transport. And in radiation transport, we know that the gradients are far less steep then uh, they are for the fluid. So at the end, we can use a much coarser mesh. And uh, then what we do is we will use the built-in mesh-to-mesh projection in, uh, in open foam to transfer the information. Um, let's say from the fluid side, we give temperature, pressure, and mixture composition to the radiation mesh. We will evaluate the uh, spectral properties of the media and we uh, transfer the, the source terms back. So yeah, exactly. It, Excuse me, excuse it's, me. It's 3D, 3D, yeah. We have online empathies, so please use microphone. Okay. So it is 3D, 2D, 3D mesh mapping for different uh, uh, phenomena, like uh, fluid to radiation, yeah. not 2D, 2D, 3D mapping. Okay. Do you do that also, 2D to 3D someplace mesh mapping? Oh. So we do either 1D to 3D when we do this system coupling, um, or 3D, 3D here for the mesh to mesh mapping, but 2D to 3D, I don't have an application. Okay, any other questions? Kazakhstan? I think there were a lot of details. I, I hope at least you, uh, you got some idea or some flavor of, of what is possible. And, uh, and in all the details you can, of course, see in the source code, you can go through all those slides. Actually, I skipped and, uh, of course, come back and ask questions. Okay, so uh, saying, I have also questions, so just like as a beginner. Uh, do you, is for peer, I mean, f f kind of applications, we are doing also, so we, are, we are doing benchmark for the sodium cooled fast reactor for the containment. <coughs> Accidents and it, it, of course it's different, but uh, theoretically, I mean, or from the mesh point of view, it can be the same unless there is important sodium boiling and you know, 
those, those types, different types of bolnik and so on. Can you extend or do, can you, uh, and what about, okay, sodium cooled fast reactors may be more complicated. What about BWR and like, Fukushima type accidents with hydrogen production and something? Is it possible to extend? <coughs> That's actually what we're doing, but with the uh, simultaneous step on going down in scale for the smaller modular reactors. Many features in BWRs, like these linked volumes, the dry well, the wet well, condensation chamber, this is something we are, we are currently doing for the SMRs, and they could also help for, for BWRs. Okay, thank you. Any other questions or comments? If not, I'd like to thank you, Stefan, again. And we go, we go for the coffee break now. Oh, no, oh, sorry. Uh, just one second.